welcome to the Smokies and Wine podcast with JB and Jamie with the best guests, wine and chat. You know it makes sense. Sponsored by Clack and View Wealth Management, working with you today to plan for your tomorrow. Welcome to the Smokies and Wine podcast. Today we are sharing a bottle of Hexama Riesling with Natasha Mackay, who's not really tasting it because she's in training, but our coach... Simon is. Um, He's kindly stepped up to the plate here. Absolutely. Yeah. Donated by our good friends at Wine and Something. Anyway, Simon, Natasha, how are you? Great, thank you. And the wine's not bad too. <laughs> yes, so anyway, cheers. We usually do, uh, we do a little clink. Cheers. cheers. And cheers to you, Natasha. Sorry, Natasha. <laughs> We're just laughing at Natasha. I <laughs> nothing. Earlier, we were lucky enough to get in and watch you do, do one of your practice sessions. It's the first time I've ever seen anyone do something like that we've been ice skating and, and things but never anything on a professional level it was incredible to watch sorry you've been ice skating you know I've been ice skating oh, he's gonna he, he told us he was going to do it he actually said that I love the way he said ice skating intermediate <laughs> <laughs> anyway what we want to do is go back and just where it all began when what age were you when you started because you were really young weren't you yes yeah, so I was about seven when I started to skate um, I went to my best friend's birthday party um, from there I begged my mum for a whole year for a pair of skates and a skating dress at the shop and she just wouldn't give in um, and I think it was my granddad eventually took me to the shop and bought me the dress then my mum had to buy me the skates after that and then I just started it from there and from seven then you get your first skates and was it when, was it was this open when yeah. you were seven yeah, yeah it so you opened in 2000 it opened yeah. um, I started in 2002 and then I got, I started on Learn to Skate. Like there's a Learn to Skate program you can join. Is that with the little penguin and yeah. stuff? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so you start with that. And then I got private lessons eventually. Um, for a year I was with a different coach. I wasn't with Debbie and Sai for a year. Um, and then I moved to them after a year. And then from there you just go up competitions and go up through the levels, like you take tests and things. So you go up through the levels and then I got to the British when my first British was actually in pairs. I had a pairs partner. Did you? Uh, yeah, that was my first British Championships. So I done that, and then my first single British was when I was nine, and that was pre novice British. Um, so within two years, nine. you were competing. Yeah. Quite high standard. Yeah, so were well, you natural at, at it, really? Um, Just, I wouldn't say I was a natural at it at all, actually. You must have remember, fallen over originally. Yeah, and... yeah. Um, I remember just walking. All I done was walk. I, like, I couldn't actually glide. It took me so long to pick up how to glide. Um, I would just like walk around while my brother, because my brother skated as well. He did hockey. So I was just literally walking <laughs> like for about, I don't know, a few months. And then eventually I was able to glide after that. Yeah. Well, I, I remember, and it was just a fear. I ha I hated it when I was young. Did, did you not have the fear? Was it just no, you were just so keen to learn? I didn't have any fear at all. I just wanted to skate. I think so. I didn't have any fear at all. But now that I coach, I see loads of other little kids who do have the fear, yeah. um, and they're <coughs> holding on, gripping onto the barriers and stuff. But I didn't have that. You were know? you pressured? Were you pressured by your parents at any point? No, never. Well, that's that's really yeah. Cool, actually, never. Yeah. I've never been pressured by my parents. It's always been me that's just so wanted to do it. We don't, we don't really see them, do we? Which is <laughs> they don't really come in. Do they like, don't get involved no, at all. No, it, it's, no. a, it's a fair point. Sometimes you like, you know, parents, as you say. I mean, you know, you can see athletes or younger skaters being pressured, and you you, you question that. But um, you know, I think with Tash, it's you know, it's fair to say. I mean, had she said I don't want to do it, they would have said, "Great, let's go." Yeah. <laughs> like not not you know no no pressure yeah. from that point of view. It's, that, it's so expensive as well. I think mum and dad would be right. like, "Yeah." That's what I was just like, go say, ahead. We'll get our holidays sport. back in the year. <laughs> so they've had to be quite supportive then if it's such an expensive yeah. sport. How did your brother feel? Was he the like the, the one who was left out on the side? <laughs> yeah. Well, he did. Um, he did ice hockey a little bit, but he wasn't too into it as much right, as what okay. I was into skating and then my, I've got a sister as well right. and she tried all different things but just wasn't very like athletic or sporty um, so eventually they just put everything into me because I was doing quite well when I was younger so that so was that. where are your brother and sister now are they just neglected in a home somewhere <laughs> <laughs> no, well, my brother, they both work in shops, but my brother, um, my brother has two kids now as well. So they so, survived it, basically. Yeah, they survived yeah, they it. They're it. fine. <laughs> They've got families and whatever now, so. You you moved down south quite early to sort of, was that to get more coaching or a, a better level of coaching? Or? Um, at the time, like, 
it was obviously my mum and dad because I was quite young so I didn't really take much to do with it but at the time they obviously thought that that's what I needed and I went down there um, and then we realised after a few years it wasn't right and then we moved back up here. Were you home? Because you were only, what, 13? Yeah, yeah, it was like 12 or 13 and I went down by myself the first two years I was down there and I basically just moved in with a family. Um, so yeah, it was quite hard being so young. Um, but eventually my mum and dad moved down because oh, they right, seen right. that. Okay. So they actually moved, like my brother, sister, like the whole family moved down south and then we just, it wasn't right, so we just all moved back and they were missing fa like home and family as well, so that's why we decided to come so back. They left the brother and sister down there, they just moved, no, they didn't really. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole family relocated after a couple yeah. of years? For you? Yeah. Were you apprehensive yeah. when you first went down or to go or were um, you just keen? To... I was just keen to go at the time and to try something new. Wow, um, at 12, 13 years old? Yeah. And was that to work with Yuri? Is it? Yeah, yeah, so it was Yuri and Marina who were the coaches there. I think people people do, I mean, you know, you say 12, 13, I think, in our sport, it's... It's quite common. You know, yeah, it's, 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 it happens quite a lot that people do move for that reason. And like we said, it's an expensive sport. Sometimes you say, you know what, absolutely, that was the right move. And sometimes you say, that's silly. Like, you know, you're nowhere near that level to, to be relocating. Um, you know, so you see that different extents of it, but... I mean, it's not it's not uncommon to yeah. for people to move because you have. I mean, we have world champions at sure. sixteen. You see it in tennis as well. You know, thirty four year old they're off to Spain to schools and stuff. Yeah, and yeah. I just find that quite Spain, yeah. Coventry. That's why you moved back. Really. <laughs> and, and did you progress at the rate you thought you would down there? Or um, when I first went, I did like there were certain things that did improve a little bit, and then I think I went through the teenage years. All right. Eventually, when I got down there, because I was 12, 13, the first two years were okay. Um, and after that, I went through the teenage years a little bit and kind of got off track. And, and I feel like a lot of skaters do go through that wherever they are. Even if I was here, I don't know if yous would maybe bring me in a little, but yeah, I just went through <laughs> it there a little bit. It's just natural, so isn't yeah. it? And boys and girls, teenagers. Yeah. Is, yeah, I've got a couple at home, yeah. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's not fun. So you were back up here, 16, 17, something yeah, like 17. that. Yeah, 17. At what stage did you two get together as as a coach? Was it straight away or? Yeah, I mean, she moved back to, you know, myself and Debbie. So, you know, I guess we're fortunate that we, you know, we have a team in Dundee. So, you know, there's not a lot of ice rinks around the country where, you know, you have a, a team that work together. You have a lot of times people who work by themselves and they try to do everything themselves. And Yuri and Marina, that's his wife. So they, in essence, have a team as well, which is why they, I believe, why they've had some success too. Yeah, I think you need a team, you can't just do it. So, you know, when Tash moved back, she kind of, I mean, she moved back to myself and Debbie and to be fair, Debbie does most of the work. I just steal the limelight. That's just the way it goes. But we know it's um, that, that dynamic today. <laughs> I was just explaining to you. <laughs> but no, and I, and I think you know, in in that whole situation, you know, like I think in any sport, you know, you have one chance to make it. So you do. You, you can never stop someone doing what they think's yeah, right because through everything they'll that. hold you to. Bl you know, it's your fault if they don't. And then when she came back, and then you know, obviously improvement happened and you know i think she as she said gone through them years and progression happens and all of a sudden everything clicked so maybe it was the right thing you know who, who's to say that she would be where she is now if she didn't move you know yeah, you, you can't second mm -hmm. guess yourself yeah, yeah. You just got to, yeah but it was a good move to come back obviously yeah definitely four times british champion before that you, you touched on a couple of things earlier on mm -hmm. what else did you win in the run-up to to that juniors novice and in novice, I don't think I did anything really in novice. I was like maybe like eight, seventh, eight every year. And then in juniors, my first year at juniors, I was third um, at my first British. And then I think I got two bronze medals at the British. Um, and I went to a junior Grand Prix. That was with you, actually. I went yeah. to junior Grand Prix. But previously, when I was in conference, I went to Youth Olympics right. as well. So I got that, I think. I maybe was like second or third on the British rankings at the time and because everyone else, I think the girl who was in first was too old or something like that so then I got to go to Youth Olympics which was a great experience. Went to seniors for the first time and I got a bronze medal the first year in seniors. Um, in seniors ages? I was, I think I was about 18. The year after that I had a horrible British the year after that and I ended up fifth. 
and then I won it the year after. What makes it horrible? Just just a bad skate. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Falling on your bum. Oh, yeah, was so, it? so the training and everything's fine, but then you just have yeah. a bad performance yeah. and that's it. We were chatting yeah. about this earlier, weren't yeah. we? It, it could all just go in a clip. Yeah, at that point, though, I didn't have the bigger jumps or anything. Like, I think I was just attempting the axle maybe at that point. Yeah. And then once I got the double axle, like, the double axle I was learning from, I was 12, and it took me until I was 19 to land, like, now, double what's axle. An, what's an axle, is that? Go in on a forward jet and then you do two and a half rotations in the air and then land. Spins. Spins, like in the air. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it took me that amount of time to land that and it usually takes someone, I don't know, maybe not as long as me. <laughs> no, to, to be fair, if you put a sticking point in figure skating jumps, it's double axel. Everyone got double axel. Oh, right, okay. And, yeah. and a lot quit because of it because they never get past it. And some click it, and then you know, and I mean, Tash. I mean, I remember her saying to me after one British, like, "I'm going to quit." So yeah. I'm like, "No, come on, let's just just stick in. Let's just no, no, I'm I'm going to quit." And then yeah. you know, then once once she broke that double axle, like she said, it then the triples kind of fell yeah. quite nicely after that as well. So all of a sudden, going from the British where you placed, where fifth. did you say fifth, to the next year winning it and winning it ever since. Mm-hmm. So. How much pressure's on you then? We'll touch on what the training regi- regime looks like just in a, in a bit. But putting your heart and soul and all that training in, how much pressure's on you when it's either it, everything's on almost four or five minutes in a competition? Yeah, it's when you say it like that, it's a lot of pressure. But I just no, I don't know. Like I don't. <laughs> it's I not don't, like quarterfinal yeah. semis. You know? It's like it's a one hit. It's like that. Go yeah. minutes and go. I don't really get that nervous and I don't really think about it at all. Like really? Yeah, when I do it, I just if I just like to be prepared, basically. If I'm prepared and I know I've been training well, I basically just stand in the middle of the ice before I start and just think, I've done it a thousand times, why can't I do it right now? I've got that. So yeah, it's all about repetition, it, repetition yeah. and just yeah, getting it perfect. Yeah, basically just getting it perfect every time. So if you've done it a thousand times, why can't you do it? there and then is there muscle memory involved in figure skating yeah. then yeah yeah definitely and you do a new routine every competition or do you carry it through from british to europe or whatever you or? carry so you have a short program and a free program and you would keep that for a full season and then you would change one every other season so you would have like your short program for two seasons and then you would change it after two seasons basically and you would do the same but do them every other season so you're not keeping the same program for well, that, that's, and that's in theory what how we've worked. I mean, that's, yeah, other that's, people change yeah, them every that, that's season. That's not a rule. Yeah. You can change it every season. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, we just make that decision, and you know, you just get in some real maturity into that program. Why throw it away? Let's mm-hmm. if it's still good, let's keep it. Like in the British Championship, so you wouldn't be able to use the same routine the next British Championship. Yeah, yeah, you could. Yeah, well, you, you can. Could. Yeah, yeah, you right. can. And that wouldn't be frowned upon by judges, or no. as long as no. you nail it, it's still the same. Yeah. Do a lot of people do that? A few do. I mean, you know, you run the risk of it going stale. That's the other yeah. thing. You know what I mean, you run the risk of it going stale. Whereas, you know, if you change it, you've got like a fresh feel about it, and then the judges haven't seen it, so they don't know what to expect. So you're not. Mm-hmm. Uh, some some keep them, and some some change them. You know, as I say, every year or every. Yeah, two years. I usually keep it for two years, don't I? Yeah. One of the things we found out today was it used to only be music but now it's songs with lyrics yeah. that you're allowed to do yeah. do you have a preference does that make any difference to you or? it doesn't really make much difference to me my short program doesn't have any lyrics um but my free program does so i just it gives you a bigger like more music to pick from doesn't it so yeah. that's the only that's, true, yeah. that's the only option it gives you and how much input do you have on the actual choreography of it I know that you've got Andrew and different people that yeah. help you with that so I actually go to I, well my short program was done by Benoit Rochaud who he's from France and then my free program was done by Mark Pillay he's Canadian so I went to Berlin last year and got my free program done um, and I will get my short program done this year in June by Mark so I don't have much to do with the choreography obviously he looks at my style and things like that, but he makes the program up and builds it basically. And how do they interpret that to you then? Do they say we need you to do a, a double axle here and a this there, or does he go out and skate it and you you see what he does? Or? Yeah, so I just yeah. copy what right, he okay. does basically. So he will skate it, and we just tell him like what jumps we're doing, and he'll pick the right like mm-hmm. pattern. We kind of have an like input that. into where where the jumps yeah and that where the elements are. go because yeah. you know you, you, we yeah. have a preference For, of. Yeah. 
yeah, it's like a tick where the box big jumps go. Yeah. Like, yeah. And you, need you know, and then he, yeah, he needs to choreograph the program around the layout that we give him, basically. Um, that's because really we, we were speaking works. earlier about us doing a, a program for you, Smokies in Mind program. So <laughs> yeah. we'll maybe come back to that later. <laughs> we're going to do it for free as well, weren't we? Absolutely. <laughs> we're going to involve uh, Disco Inferno again. That's our <laughs> go to. That's our go to. Go to you one. And they were going to do their own pair program too. The two of them. It's going to go well. I can, I can visualise the lifting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. When you were growing up, did you was there any other skaters that either inspired you or you looked up to? Or when I was mm. really young, when I first started skating, I loved Sasha Cohen. She skated for the USA. She won the Olympics, didn't she? Uh, silver, it was silver. Silver, the Olympics, yeah, yeah, she was silver. Yeah, I loved watching her skate. Um, I trained with loads of people, but Jenna McCorkle, who's Olympic. now she was the eleven yeah. times British champion and went to Olympics two times and. I trained with her and just seeing how hard she worked and like what she done, um, that was a big inspiration as well because we tra- she trained here as well. And were you inspired by Tonya Harding or anything like that? Maybe or? no. <laughs> oh, but we do take a baseball bat with us to competitions. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I see some of the places you're bound to end up. <laughs> the get the girl that played her in the movie, the the blonde. Margot Margot, Margot Robbie. Margot Robbie. What did you think of her skating? Did she do a decent job? A decent fist of it? Yeah, I think she did. You weren't sitting watching uh, it going, what the heck is that? <laughs> no, no, she did do a decent job of it, I think. With the the British, the, you couldn't have defended that uh, last year, so yeah. that potentially would have been five times, let's say, you would have been five times. <laughs> yeah. This year, COVID sort of hit again, but you were lucky enough to be able to get to the Worlds. Yeah. Um, what was the experience like being out in Stockholm? Um, it was so different, this ISU Championships compared to the other ISU Championships purely because, well, there was a bubble scenario this time that we had to go into. So we got there and we had to do a PCR test and we were quarantined for 24 hours and we weren't allowed to leave the hotel at all throughout the whole time we were there. Once you've done that and you've done your quarantine, you were allowed out and then you would have tests throughout the week as well. And you basically just went from the hotel to the rink. Obviously, everyone had their masks on, but it was the having no crowd. That was like the biggest difference for me. But the team were there and the team were great. Like you heard them, like they were loud. You heard them cheering and it was really nice (coughs) to have them there. But it was just different, wasn't it? Yeah, it was usually like if you'd land a triple or whatever, you get a big roar. Yeah. And there's just nothing. And there was just nothing. nothing. A little no crap, but to be fair, you don't really like when you when you're in your program, you don't really hear it. You do hear it, but you don't really take it in because you're just focusing on what you're doing. Yeah, but I think it was I think it was a really good championships. I've got to say it was yeah, like it was. way better than we anticipated. Right. Okay. Um, good. Mm-hmm. You know the experience, the way that they were. I mean, you just think the amount of PCR tests they must have gone through, how smooth it was, the process. You know, obviously the facility worked great because the hotel was attached to the rink. So, you know, you literally never went outdoors. It certainly couldn't have impacted you in a bad way because did you not get a personal best? Yeah, well, I did. It didn't impact me in a bad way. You, I just thought the same thing was what I said earlier about you've done it before, you can do it again. I mean, it was the first time I'd competed in over a year. My training had gone quite well leading up to it. So it was in, the in same In a way, it was the same scenario. for everybody, wasn't it? Yeah, no. I think oh, we. Well, ish. actually, I don't mm, think it would be because you've got places that would have a lot no, more ice. Yeah, well, no, yeah, so yeah. The yeah. scenario, the the rink was the same, the bubble scenario was the same, but you know, I think it's fair to say, I think you know, we looked at the competitors around and about Tash, and the least anyone had competed in the last twelve months was twice. Most of them four or five times, so they've been out there competing. Russia's been out competing with an audience like. Non-stop. The whole time. So, really? Yeah. yeah. So, so you know, you put that into the mix and then we've not competed for 13 months and you go out there and that's that's not a level playing field. But, you know, again, we were advised not to travel, which wasn't safe. Don't, don't travel unless absolutely necessary. And World Championships was necessary because this year, obviously, was a, was a qualifier. And, um, you know, that was kind of essential, but the others weren't. And we took the sensible approach. We didn't travel didn't compete but yeah absolutely everyone else around us had competed for sure and it really hampered your training because being short of ice time did you not have to end up skating in fields and puddles (laughs) and things like that 
Yeah, so we were off the ice for at the start for about four or five months. Yeah. Sai and Debbie had set up everything and we were doing just on Zoom and we were just doing jumps, off ice jumps class, circuits, Pilates, everything. And then we had to travel after that to Bradford. We got some elite ice in Bradford. That was the only ice rink open. So we travelled there for about... In the UK? That was yeah, the yeah. Well, yeah. It, it wasn't open to the public. Yeah, yeah. But it was, so yeah. British Ice Skating had to put one place that they would use as a an elite training centre for that period of time. And it was really hard to get it approved by the government but they did and Bradford was the one so so yeah we had to travel kind of every yeah. week down there do four days travel back go the next week yeah and then after that we got back into Dundee in about August didn't we and then we were in from August on a kind of normal schedule but not completely normal because we couldn't have off ice classes and things until around until Christmas actually Christmas Eve was our last time we were in and then we were off again for a little while and then we got back in before Worlds. But you were, I'm not, I didn't make that up, did I? You no, were skating you in fields and puddles and I things, was, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. I've seen um, the videos. <laughs> yeah, I was. That was over Christmas. And it's just, a, like, it's such a good experience to be able to, like, skate outdoors. I loved it. So, basically, the field was just at the back of my house. Right. So, okay. I was just going out there and just getting right. extra, so extra she, training. <laughs> she was, she was jumping out there. She was yeah, doing, was doing proper stuff. So, she yeah. was in essence training because she was doing like what you saw the same today, moves that you yeah, made yeah. Yeah. yeah um you know obviously a bit of a different kind of slightly ice, smaller ice not as good a bit smaller yeah the ice is the ice is totally different it's nowhere near as good it's all bumpy and obviously it doesn't yeah. get resurfaced so it's just all snow by the time you've used it um i use my old skates as well so like it don't ruin my blades so right. like if you get a stone or something like that but yeah, it was it was a good experience. Did you not hit rollerblading for a little while as well? <laughs> yeah, so these are all my lockdown <laughs> adventures. <laughs> yeah, I did get into rollerblading because it doesn't it does feel the same, but jumping and spinning it just does not feel the same. But yeah, I enjoyed that. I did that in the summer um, when we had no ice at all, and that was nice as well to do that. Now, do you do some gymnastic training because? I've recently seen a photograph of you in a door, <laughs> in a door frame, <laughs> and that is just... Yeah. I don't actually do any gymnastic training, for the listeners, I think. We'll Ta post this, are we okay to post that picture? Yeah, that's yeah. fine, yeah. We'll post this photo of Tash in a door frame, and if it's you didn't know differently, you think she was lying down. <laughs> it's, just, it's just bizarre, I don't know how the hell you imagine that, so... What the? You basically just push your back and your foot against the... Actually, what made you come up with it in the first place? Debbie. Oh. Of course it was Debbie. <laughs> it's your wife's she, fault. she comes up with she has loads of different ideas and she was sending me loads of pictures when we were in lockdown. Like, try this, try this, try this. So that's what I spent half my days doing when we were in lockdown. All, all your weight's on one leg, yeah? So That leg's locking you in, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that leg locks you in and you're just pretty much pressed against the, the door with your back and your other leg. And you just push into that one leg. Oh, yeah. You should so, see how many kids we had at A and E who tried it. Yeah, I should <laughs> like, like, down the door. I'm going to post this on smokiesandwine.co.uk, so you need to check it out. It's bizarre. <laughs> Is that true? Do people copy you then? Because you're obviously a, a role model. Would that, would that be the, yeah. the thing to say? Yeah. Do you get people copying you either your moves on ice or things like this? Yeah, with that, that became like a challenge. Like I think Ice Dundee put it on their social media, and we're right. like trying Natasha's challenge or something like that and there were so many people trying it right. we'll, <laughs> we'll send you one of us yeah. there were so many people trying it and it was it was nice to see everyone doing it you must have but seen yeah, a lot of fails did. yeah there was a lot of sliding down the doors <laughs> landing on their heads <laughs> so we're out there in Stockholm we place high enough to claim the Olympic spot are we allowed to say this yet? yeah yeah I mean you know I think that's well, it's out, there. Yeah. it's out there. How exciting is it that you're going to represent your country? By the way, congratulations for that. That's amazing. <laughs> that is Thank outstanding. You. Yeah, it's so exciting. Like, just to... Obviously, it's not my spot. Um, yeah. Because we have to... Oh, right. Through, like, yeah, it's not locked in. It's a confusing, Simon. I'll Simon will explain. <laughs> Simon will explain. Well, so... No, I mean, it's, it's, it's like every sport's the same. So, you know... Natasha went to world championships and qualified a quota spot for Great Britain in ladies figure skating. So we now have a lady going to the Olympic Games from Amazing. Great Britain. And who that will be is up to British Ice Skating, the Federation. So they will have their criteria. Of course, 
the British Olympic Association have their criteria as well. So anyone who is going to be in the mix come December, which is when so the announcement off, yeah. will be made. To be fair, you know, they've got to go and hit scores that Nastasha's hit in the past. You know, it's not just a free-for-all. You know, we can't just send someone who's, you know, scoring, let's say, 120 points as opposed to 170. Um, you know, so they've got to meet the, the, the British Olympic Association criteria. And then there's a calculation process that comes in from the Federation. But I guess really what I'm saying is the hardest job's done. Like we've yeah. qualified a spot or yeah. Natasha's qualified a spot for Great Britain and that's not easy done these days. So you don't have to do a skate off or anything like that. It's, it's Yeah, that, it'll, it'll, come, it'll come down to the, so if, if other athletes get the required score um, that the British Olympic Association have, you know, what they approve, which is effectively um, around about 169 points, then from that point it will be dependent upon what they do this season scores will be added together from international events national championships and the, there'll be a calculation process that they come up with and the one with the most points at the end of the day will be the one that goes all right so there are still things to skate through to qualify yeah. in a way mm -hmm. there's still things to yeah. skate through to potentially qualify the right. spot as an attachers yes yes um there's nothing else to do to qualify a spot for great britain we have that already is there anyone don't want to talk about competitors and things like that but is there anyone close <laughs> that could take don't the watch, spot don't from watch you them. you're the british champion so by definition you're the best skater out there <laughs> come on Sai. <laughs> she's too she's blushing she, she does and natasha ultimately of course she doesn't want to speak, I understand speak that. about anything you know out of turn or i i guess you know, at the top of any sport, yes, you're confident in yourself, and and secondly, you, you know, you just focus on your own job. I mean, what what Natasha does very well is just do what she can do. If she does what she can do, that's it. Um, so, is there anyone close? I guess the easy answer at the moment is nobody's hit the score they're going to need to hit in the past. Okay, they're all going to have to score better than they've scored in the past to be in the mix. And if they don't score that, then the spot will be Natasha's. And would, would those people likely be from Dundee or elsewhere? Because Dundee's quite a... We didn't yep, realise yep. this, but Dundee's a huge yep, we have a couple. bed for figure skating. Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, we have a couple of skaters in Dundee that will be out to, to achieve that score. Sheffield, further down south. So there's about, there's about five others on the British performance team who will be out to try and achieve that score. And, and yeah, two of them, in addition to Tasha from Dundee. So... Let's assume it happens. What will it mean to you to represent Team GB? Well, I've worked my whole career to go to the Olympics. Basically, that's the end goal. Since I was a little kid, that's what you dream about, going to the Olympics. So it would just, it would mean everything to be able to go out and represent Britain at the Olympics. Right. Now, this is February, is it February it's on? Yeah. It's next year? Yeah. Now, I've not looked up the weather in Beijing. And I know it won't affect the skater. <laughs> but Winter Olympics in Beijing, I thought they only had four or five days snow a year um i'd like to say i could answer but i can't <laughs> i'm sure they shoot something in the clouds that makes it happen so other than that i don't know <laughs> I should, I, i've lived in asia for 20 years so i should answer this but i'm not going to bother it's beijing it's a shithole i'm, I'm sure <laughs> i'm sure they will make it happen said it. <laughs> <laughs> it might be covid snow but there'll be some yeah. kind of snow uh, the snow will not be pure white out there that's for sure <laughs> So, in terms of your regime at the moment and how you may or may not step up, I don't know if it gets stepped up, between now and going to the Olympics, how much more intense does training become compared to what it is at the moment? This is the time where I'll go and get a new programme and try to get harder elements to put in the programme for next season. So that's what I'm really pushing at the minute is trying to get the harder elements now so that I can then put them in the programme for next season. Um, and just build it that way. And what's the 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 hardest? I don't want to say trick, but the hardest routine or spin or movement, whatever the word was. Oh, well, is it when you fell on your ass twice <laughs> today, dude? Yeah, yeah, that that won't be in my program. No. <laughs> I think it's. I think it's it, again. It's kind of complicated. I, I'm kind of going to jump in because it's, you know, coaches have a saying what they do at the end of the day so it may well be that she does one jump which is worth more 
the grade of execution that the judges give may be lower than a, an easier jump. So ultimately, that easier jump may gain us more points than the harder one. So we, we really got to play the maths to make sure that we get the maximum points 99% of the time that we can get. And, and then you rely on that. So when Tash said earlier, I stand there knowing I've done it a thousand times. Part of that is making sure the program is everything that we know she can do a thousand times. And it's pointless as putting doubt in her mind before she goes to skate. So if she's hitting something 50% of the time and we're going to qualify an Olympic spot, we're not doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we're going to play to our strengths. So, you know, the harder elements obviously are worth more, but you've still got to do them well. And if you don't, the lesser elements become more valuable. Now, is there a, a limit to the amount of elements you can put in? You know what I mean? Could you squeeze in more that you like? Or? No, there's a limit. So there's three jumps in a short program, three spins and a step sequence. And then in a free program, you've got seven jumps, three combination jumps, three spins, step sequence and a choreo sequence in a free program. So you do have like specific requirements that you have to do in each program. And who will choreograph the Olympic Dance, will that be back to Rashad again or Smokey's and mine? Yeah. Well, that's the one you were doing. Yet? Have you not made a decision yet? <laughs> um, it's, up, it's over the bit. We're going to get it done by Mark Pillay, who done my free programme. Right, okay. So we're going to go back to him. I really enjoyed working with him last time, so we're going to go back there and. So he's a well, well known Canadian choreographer. Yeah. Uh, he works in Europe with a, a lot of skaters from Europe as well pair skaters, single skaters, um, you know, again, you find something that works for you. So, you know, he's, he's hopefully, COVID permitting, yeah. going to be in Austria end of June and that's where we're going to go and get the free program oh, choreographed. Right, okay. uh, sorry, the short program choreographed and, and then we'll take these programs through to Olympics. Yeah. Now, do all the skaters in Dundee, do they use the same or do you just, everybody use their own person? No, everyone has a, a choice. I mean, we have a great choreographer who works in Dundee, um, Andrew, who he moved over from Glasgow, coach, choreographer, and he, he's kind of, he was good and he's learnt more and he's the choreographers that Natasha's worked with, he's, you know, worked with Perfect. as well to, to build his own credentials at the same time. Um, so he works with all of the skaters here. So he still choreographs um, some of the senior skaters uh, and when Natasha's doing her programs that's been choreographed by others, he'll have spoke to that choreographer and he'll keep an eye on that program as well for them in essence, just oh, making, cool. you know, because yeah. it's it's a forte. Choreography yeah. is not, I mean, I couldn't do it. It's not something I do. Yeah. So, you know, you need a specialist and, and that becomes, you know, obviously when I saw you on the ice today, we had to, you know, get that penguin out and choreograph that really well. But <laughs> So you, it's a specialist. <laughs> I mean, just on that, because there is a, a big difference between a choreographer and, and someone that's a, a technical specialist. Um, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm going to say, would, would it be fair to say, are you the most decorated coach in the UK? I'd, I'd have to add it up, but I, I say I say me, and, it, and, I, and I mean kind of the team. Of course, yeah. It's, you you know, Deb, only... Debbie was coaching, you know, been coaching longer than I have and, you know, went to Olympics as a coach back in 92 with, at the time, Joanne Conway, who, who was um, British champion back then. So, um, you know, from that perspective, if, you know, if you add in um, as a team, I think, yeah, we, we probably have had um, our fair share of British champions and people going to Olympics between us. And, you know, it's, it's yes, as coaches, decorated, if it's the right word, um, but, you know, you, you kind of have to offset that a little bit to the, the, the whole team around you, not just not just us. Because I think, did you post a picture the other day? There was something like 21 senior titles in the yeah. the, 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 the sort of the team, which is incredible. Yeah. yeah. And uh, until we started doing a little bit of research, because we were coming out to see you, mm -hmm. you go and you read the papers, it's obviously full of football, rugby, things like this. With Dundee being such a massive place for, for figure skating it doesn't really get the press that it does I mean Christ's sake you go to the Olympics <laughs> do you do you feel it gets the, the the press pages that it deserves um no no I don't I mean you know we, we, we're trying to build that we're trying to build that um you know you're trying to get that input and of course come the Olympics now it's you know that's the the biggest event 
of anyone's career. So to have someone at the Olympic Games will again give us a little bit more kudos to be able to to get you know people involved and, and publicize the sport. Yeah, I mean it's not a high profile sport like football. It's not something that you does can it, compete does it with. Need like. more funding so this the elevation of status would that bring more much needed money into it. Again, you come back to, first of all, have someone at the Olympic Games, we can build a profile of the sport. And the more we can build a profile of the sport, we can not only have someone at the Olympic Games, but we push for someone to medal at the Olympic Games. And then it's a different ball game. Then, then the money comes in because ultimately people like, you know, the British Olympic Association, you know, we're not saying anything out of turn by saying, of course, they, they want medals. They don't, you know, they don't want you to be 30th. Yeah. They, they want medals. And, and when you get medals, then you know or when you can prove that you're on that track to medals then you know you, you will get a little bit more yeah. more income more support that way there must be a lot of training other than just the two or three hours that you're on the ice what what else does your training consist of yeah you mentioned um, pilates a couple of times yeah we do well we do strength and conditioning um we do pilates we do just off ice jump classes off ice circuit classes um, use the spinners like there's like little plates like you can get that you could they spin oh, right. and you practice your spins and that on them and I really like running so I run quite a lot there's a, a lot there's, there's <laughs> the thing how do you go over the dizziness is it um, just I think out you just get used to it yeah it's just just because that is mental like you're what 10 rotate and more than that yeah. 20 30 and you... yeah you just get used to it I think your brain just gets used to it after so many times. I remember though when we were off for the four or five months, like when I went back and done my first spin, I was like, oh my god, I was seeing stars. Like, because you're just not used to it. Like after yeah. having that four or five months off, so yeah, you definitely. I think you just get used to it because after that, I was I couldn't. Like I can't come back to you. I was like, I can't see a thing. I think it's an interesting point, which I'm not mm -hmm. sure if you're aware of, but like Tash, for example, she jumps one direction mm -hmm. and spins the opposite direction. You, you obviously didn't notice today. You were too busy I training yourself. I noticed. Yourself. Was, JB was busy. asking me and I had to tell him. Oh. Yeah. So, so when she jumps and rotates in the air, yeah. she jumps clockwise direction. Every wow. time. Every time. Every you, time. Only, you only jump one way. Normally you jump and spin the same way. I, I'm not sure of anyone else at World Championships that does that. No, not at the minute. I don't know. Um, so she jumps and, and I, why? I don't really know. But Just obviously she's, it's not something you're going to change now. But when she spins on the ice... She spins in anti-clockwise direction. Yeah. It's kind of weird. It's kind of strange, which kind of sums up Tash, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> Is it to do with, that's like, a... you have a stronger <clears throat> foot for takeoff and... Um, I think it was just when I was little. Like, when I first started with the first coach I was with, she just basically just let me do what I wanted, I think. So she was like... And it was that was just my it's just ingrained preferred in you way. Now. Yeah, and then I remember when I moved to Sign Deb, Debbie tried to change me to jump and spin the same way but I just wasn't having any of it and I just refused I remember refusing like, I'm not doing it anymore um, and just went back to my normal what I was doing it's just easier so it's weird you don't see yeah. it very often at all I, I don't I'm not aware of anyone really at the moment who does that uh, not that you get any more points sure. for it or any less no. points but it's just a uh, yeah. Um, you just get classed a weird though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I teach one little girl who does it actually. Um, oh, that's, and I blame because, the coach. because I do it, I don't want to then say to her it's the wrong thing yeah. to do. So Is she doing it because of you or is she just No, another, she just naturally just, just wanted to do it. It's just another <laughs> yeah, it's just another one of me. <laughs> so but she's fine, like she can do things both directions really, but she just feels more comfortable spinning and jumping in so that you, direction. You coach as well, the youngsters and yeah, I coach as well, just like the little ones coming up. Do you um, see any potential in? Yeah, you see potential in some of the little ones coming up and it's just nice to see once you've coached them, like the other side of it, instead of being coached, it's nice to see them achieving like things as well. And um, that's what I like about coaching the most. Obviously, you've, you're not having a glass of wine with us today, but what does your diet look like in general? Yeah, I eat pretty healthy normally or unless I'm having a cheat meal or something normally I'm healthy and I'll just eat like basic food basically I don't drink when I'm training and just try to be as healthy as I can just so that I've got enough energy for when I'm on the ice um breakfast is usually like porridge or wheat a bit like it's very 
struck my mind. It's like I don't like a oh, lot of oh, things. Actually, sorry, sorry. I'm going to jump in there. I do remember Weetabix. She told me I had to try heating up. I've never done that. <laughs> have you ever had warm Weetabix? That's what I used to do. Yeah. That's what I used to do as a kid. And Frosties. Yeah. You have to heat it up. Yeah, I've had I've had warm Frosties as well. <laughs> my mum used to make you Maybe it's Frosties a Scottish with thing. hot milk and banana. Oh, that was before banana. I went to school. Yeah. yeah. I remember that. Yeah, and it fills you up more. <laughs> yeah, because it's warm, it fills you up more. Yeah. So, yeah, you sorry. In Scotland, I, you need yeah. it needs to be heated up. Yeah. I don't eat before I train, so I usually train in the morning, like, 6 till 10. So I won't eat until after I have, like, a bit of fruit or something in my break. And then I'll eat when I get home about 11 o'clock. We usually have Pilates 10 till 11. So I eat around 11. So then I don't really want lunch because usually if I do have lunch, it'll be, like, a salad or... Something like that. And then for dinner, it's usually like chicken, rice, veg, or normal things, but just quite healthy. So, so it's so kind of a vegan, vegetarian. No, 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 no. Like that, nothing like that. I've just. <laughs> no. We do have one athlete who's vegan. Yeah. And actually, a Canadian athlete who doesn't skate now. She was. A, there's mm-hmm. the odd person I know who who's vegan. It has its own kind of mm-hmm. issues within it because, you know, it's never easy to go to a competition and find the right food sometimes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you know, I kind of—it's it's kind of a myth that you know you, they don't eat or whatever. It's just you know, they, they eat the right food and they feel better doing yeah. that. So it's yeah. not a set number of calories in a day no. or anything no, like no, that. No, 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 just just trying to eat the right food that you can get the most energy from, basically. And more importantly, what's your cheat meal? Uh, pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and what they leave, I take. So <laughs> <laughs> pizza, yeah. Or after the British every year, we go to TGI's and I get the. Jack Daniels chicken strips and sweet potato fries. That's my go-to after British meal <laughs> every yeah. year. Eh? Yeah. I'm like, sorry, we're going to TGI's after the free program. On the subject of fast <laughs> food, coming into this ice rink, there's a McDonald's at the end of the road. <laughs> now, yeah. Ar- the Arbroath McDonald's is the busiest place in our town, but that's got traffic control. Yeah, yeah, it's only since <laughs> lockdown. I don't Unbelievable. know. Unbelievable. There's it's... four guys out in high vis jackets. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Directing you in. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't like that. Gosh before lockdown at all it's just since lockdown everyone's like we've not had our mcdonald's in like five it's months we'll just have it every night yeah. <laughs> absolutely I know. see at the olympics do you get to stay for the whole duration of the the olympics like in the olympic village etc regardless of you know whether you get a gold medal whether you get put out in the early stages um, like your events on the first day you don't go home all all depends all depends on the amount of um, accreditation that the Olympic Association oh, get. Right, okay. It depends depends on when your event is. So, if I go on the experience of Sochi when I was there as a coach and and the and Jenna who was competing at the time, so we're in the team event, which is also possible this time. It's a long shot, but it's possible. The Jenna skated, for example, the day before the opening ceremony. That was the team event short program. And then her own event was two days before the closing ceremony. So you were there that duration, you had no choice. Sochi was a nightmare and Beijing will be the same. You're not gonna fly back and train at home for two weeks and fly back again. You know, the people that have took information kind of so far, you know, we've said, ideally we need to be there at least five days before we compete because of the distance. But normally they're not too bad on, oh, you're done, you're out. But it's just a kind of timing process. Right, okay. Some people don't get to do the opening ceremony. Some don't get to do the closing. It just depends if you have to pass accreditations over. You only get so many. Yeah. The competition's later this year. It's like the 15th and 17th, and I think the Olympics finish on the 20th. So I'll be skating near the end. And how many Olympics have you been to so far, Simon? So as a coach, I went to Sochi, and as a specialist, I went to Vancouver in 2010 and Pyeongchang in 2018. So, providing Natasha does a job, she'll continue my kind of <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, my side. No she doesn't feel she pressure. Doesn't screw it up. No, she didn't feel like, no. That's why I have her so well prepared, right? So. <laughs> What do you do in your downtime then? What do you do to relax? Um, whether it be hobbies, whether it be anything else. Skating on ponds. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really have that much time. Like when I'm skating and coaching, it takes up so much time. So basically in my down t- downtime, I spend time with my family, boyfriend, go and see my nephews. Like there's not that much, I don't have that much time. And you still love it. You know what I mean? You don't get fed up with it or anything. The passion's no. still there. 
No, I think the only time I got fed up with it was when I couldn't get the jumps. But, like, I'd been trying to get that jump for, like, so many years. and But now, since winning the first British, I've never got fed up of it. Cost me 6,000 quid to keep it up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and, what, and what clicked for the jump then? What, what actually happened? I don't know. Like, it just... Well, I can say what I think. Because, as I said before, you know, I mean, Debbie did a lot of work with Tash and does a lot of technique work. So I, I think what we find in our coaching relationship is Debbie's very good technically figure, like loves figuring things out. Mm-hmm. As much as I enjoy doing the technical side, I find maybe like more working with their mind really make you know kind of being positive in that way um and i remember at the time when she and debbie was working with her and they were doing jump after jump after jump and you'd miss and you'd you know and you could see the frustration and it's easier when you take a step back you could see logically where it was going and what she was trying to do and that's easier from a coach's point of view and not so much you know skaters miss it still miss it still miss it and and it gets a point where you feel like oh i could have done that and when you get that feeling, the whole thing changes because all of a sudden it's there. And then when you land the first jump, oh, that feels easier than when I miss it. Like, And that's just timing. Like any sport, if you hit a golf ball well, it's easier than when you're really swinging at it and you just don't connect very well. And it's the same with jumps. Like, mm-hmm. and, and I could see the progress. And as I say, I mean, you know, at that time, I mean, Debbie did a lot of work with her own technique. And they went, I remember I stood there and they stood there and forever was like, you know, and I thought this kid's going to come off black and blue in a minute, and then, <laughs> but they, they, you know, they got there, and you know, they worked through it, and I think it was a combination of one, you know, the commitment to keep going, and two, which I think is a key thing in our sport, probably in every sport, is the trust, the fact that, you know, if Debbie said to her when they were working on that double axel, you need to put your right hand in the air she'd put her right hand in the air and you know and that that's a massive thing because it's so easy to think no that's stupid that's not going to work you know so I I remember watching it and then when she did that and then hit the triples the same you know it was a big difference and I think the going away to train at a different rink and come back and you know that relationship gets stronger and you trust each other even more and and I think that that was kind of the biggest key factor that I saw when she started hitting the new jumps. Now you mentioned about, oh, she's going to come off black and blue. It's inevitable you're going to have a few bumps and scrapes, but have you ever had any serious injuries on the ice? Um, Touch wood. I've not actually had any serious injuries. Brilliant. Yeah. I think, like, because I got the harder jumps when I was older as well, probably, because when you're putting your body through so much when you're younger, then you start getting injuries and things like that. But because I got them when I was older, I think that's maybe helped me a little bit. But no, the most I've done is like brush my eyebrow open. I think that's I done that like two years ago. I don't even but, like the sound of that. But <laughs> other than that, I've not had any broken bones. Touch wood. Oh, there was a girl so. in my wife's my wife's school teaching. I think it was in her class at school in ice ice rink in Dundee in in, in Hong Kong. Sorry, and she lost a finger. <gasps> she fell. No. Uh, oh no. She fell over and. Uh, yeah, I, stuff. you know she got yeah. a stitch back on everyone but yeah you must have seen a few Simon no, no. touch wood I know I'm gonna <laughs> sorry about that I, I'm not I mean, <laughs> I'm really not scared. we're quite we're quite fortunate <laughs> we're quite fortunate that, that we haven't really you know as I say touch wood had any bad injuries like that I mean we, we, okay we've had the odd athlete who broke a leg it like happens blade in the foot blade in the foot's another one because they rotate like this and if yeah. the blade goes through the boot and in the foot right. we get to the olympics and massive achievement as you've, as you've said that's what you want to yeah. you know from a little girl after the olympics what would be next um so i always said that i would go until the olympics and then i would quit and retire because it's not that common for skaters to skate after they're 30, really. And I'll be 20, just turned 27 at the Olympics. But I just, I don't feel like I'm done yet because I think the reason like I got my jumps when I was older, so I don't, I feel like I've got more to give. So I'm going to stay on after the Olympics and try to get harder jumps and try to get better. So yeah, I'm not going to. 
Now, in, in my day, it was Torval and Dean and cousins and all that. And then she wasn't even born when Torval and Dean was out, were you? But no. when they retired from competitive skating, they all went to Vegas and all these things. Is that still a thing now? You can, that go, was where all you the can big go into shows was. and stuff, can't you? There's still shows. There's still shows. Yeah, still, you could like, throw a ship, the, the bigger so. ones are like Holiday on Ice and Disney on Disney. Ice, and because that in those days it was that was where they made their money because there was nothing in the yeah. Olympics really. Mm-hmm. No, that's right. I mean, you know, it's not. It's um, not like that now. You don't have to go and where, I mean, dance with people. <laughs> we're an money. amateur. We're an amateur sport. That's fair to say. So we, we're classed as amateurs. If you're professional, then if you coach, you're a professional. Like I say, for these guys, they pay. They pay to skate. They pay to train, and they pay to compete. You know, and that was something that was really strange at the last Olympics. I was there as a coach in Sochi. You know, you sat next to. You know, you go and dine the hall, and you sat next to the Swedish. Um, hockey team and there you've got Henrik Lundqvist who's multi-millionaire hockey player sat there and we're like struggling to pay to train doesn't doesn't make sense and I know they've changed that since and you know they have a kind of different format with the hockey now but yeah it's weird as a as an amateur sport so when you turn professional i.e coach going shows then obviously that's that's when you look to hopefully recoup a little bit of what you or your parents have, have put in over the many years, you know. Yeah. Is that an option for you? No. Um. I when I quit, I want to coach. Yeah, we I don't want, want to, it to go. I want to be a coach. To shows because from our point of view, like it'd be great to have us part of the coaching team, and and she's always been that way inclined. Some will want to go in a show because they're that way as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is which is fine, but like again, selfishly from Dundee's point of view, well, what an accolade to have someone who's achieved that and then be coaching yeah. in the facility as well, of course. And giving back, yeah. And do you have to go and sit your coaching exams or have you already started um, that process? I've already or? done it, so I'm a fully qualified coach now, so I've already done that a few years ago. Right. So right now it's part-time because obviously I have to train, so I'll just become a full-time coach once I eventually quit. Do you ever get tempted? Now we've we've been to one in our youth. Okay, mm-hmm. used to go to the the skating discos, the ice skating discos, and the foam and that came out. Yeah. Have you ever been tempted to go to that and really show off? <laughs> no, oh. I, I used to go to it when I was younger Is as it? well. Yeah, with you my must brother. have been the best. No, I actually wasn't at that time. <laughs> that was when I was at my walking stage. So I used to go about and just walk around the disco basically. But I like taking my nephews, and we went at Christmas, and they had like a little Christmas disco thing in that. <laughs> So that's the only recent one I've been to, but Not I wasn't, same, is it? wasn't doing any showing off because I was holding him up the whole time <laughs> I was there. Hey, JB took JB took us to the disco. <laughs> He's an idiot. Like he says, we'll go to the disco. <laughs> He says it's full of girls. He says it's, we were like seventeen. He says it's full of girls. You can't fail. And I said, but you'll have to be able to skate. And he went, no, you don't. You don't have to worry. Got there. The, po- the person says, no, you have to be able to skate. Straight away, JB, full of shit as usual. Just went. Of course we can skate. <laughs> well, you'll have your own skates. No. Oh, no. And then we, basically we blagged our way on the ice on a Saturday night disco. And then we were absolutely shocking. It was the most embarrassed I think I've ever been. But the winner was, because we were falling our ass all the time, all these girls came up and took our hands. <laughs> <They helped you. laughs> and then within about an hour, we were in the group of about eight girls, eight girls. and they're towing us around the ice. It was awful. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> well, but things like, you know, and I don't know if it gives less prestige, but but more interest in, in the sport but things like dancing on ice um, that's when you, know, you see these celebrities get a bit of training and then they're out on ice for a minute doing some better than others what's your thoughts on that type of thing is that a good thing for the sport just who, a bit of fun or? both of you but let's oh. go Natasha first because she's pointing at you so we'll put her on the spot look at her cringing there <laughs> um, I take it you're a fan you're not well, I, do, I do actually watch it and like I enjoy watching it but for me, I would never do it, purely because I just don't want to be picked up by a boy who can't skate. <laughs> but I think it is good for getting skating out there. But would that potentially be the type of thing that they would come calling you saying, would you like to be a, um, the, the pro version of the skaters? I, I, well, Simon. I, yeah, I mean, I would like to think so. If that was something that continued, then, you know, I mean, what better to have on Dance and yeah. Rise than someone who's multi-times national champion so yeah it makes sense what do i think about the show i do watch it because i actually think it's great for the sport 
I think it's massive for the sport. I think when the first series of Dancing on Ice started, our Learn to Skate queue went around the building. So from that point, I think it's great. There's some people, there's some pros on the show, I'm, I'm not afraid to say it, who have been excellent and have been at the top of the sport and been to European and World Championships. There's some pros on the sport on Dancing on Ice who I question sometimes when I watch them who's a pro and who's the celeb right yeah. but that's that's just being honest I mean I didn't mention any names but that's you know that sometimes you see that but I do think they do a, an absolutely fantastic job with the show Is skating one of the hardest sports out there? I think it is I, yeah and you're not biased at all no but I do honestly <laughs> think it is like, I agree I what, mean, what yeah. makes it the hardest then what, what, what would you say makes it the hardest yeah I, I, I'd probably say the hardest Olympic sport if you really push me I'd, I'd, I'd have to ask you what other sport is harder than figure skating in the Olympic Games because there's fitness there's no, I'm asking you now like, oh, right. <laughs> is there one that you can think of Honestly, because I, you know, I look at it and I think what it takes, you're right, fitness, agility, the strength, the performance side. Artistic side, yeah. Yeah, the, the jumping side, the, the actual technical side. I Tobogganing, I think, is really skillful. What is? Tobogganing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I saw you trying that when you went on today's session. What about the? I actually don't understand that as a sport. What about the sled? You know, with the the ski jumps when they're doing yeah. the flips in the air and that. That's that's got to be there or thereabouts with you guys. I, I always come back to the same. If Eddie I, the eagle can do it, yeah, it's, it's, that's Eddie, just falling off a hill. Eddie's probably why we've got that enhanced BOA criteria, <laughs> right? And I'm not against a criteria being set that says we've got to send someone who's credible and f I'm fully for that. That's probably where it came from, if I'm honest. If I took anyone and put them into figure skating, could they make the Olympic Games as opposed to taking a figure skater and putting them in their sport? I think the figure skaters going into a different sport would do better. It's just my honest opinion. I don't, I don't see, I think the least amount of time that it's took anyone in the world to get to an Olympic Games is 12 years from right. starting. Wow. Whereas some of, well, most sports, you know, you can't, and, and, that, and that's a problem we face when you're trying to get new people in the sport. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even like, Anything. you know, we're in ice sports, let's take curling. Curling's obviously big in Scotland and we're very successful. So first of all, we're that's, very that's successful. That's just failed lawn bowlers though. <laughs> I'm not saying that because we are very successful and they do get us some winter medals. But again, can you achieve Olympic Games in less than 12 years? Yeah, for sure. Can you do it in figure skating? No. Can you go on a cycle and go to summer games in less than 12 years? Yeah, for sure. But can you do figure skating? No. So I, I do. And I don't mean that in any disrespect to any sport. I just think we're in one of the hardest Olympic sports that there is. So. Let me get this right. We were skating royalty in the hardest sport <laughs> at the Winter Olympics. That's what we just said there, isn't it? That's incredible. It's a, it's a good job we bought the wine, I'll tell you. <laughs> we'll just to elevate this further. <laughs> but curling, I find that a bit bizarre as well, isn't it? It's I did, just I, stones on ice and a brush. It's like, what the hell is it? It's stones on ice and a brush, yeah. It's like, I, did, I did try it, though. I did try it. I did... I did play one season. Did you? Any yeah. good? It was hard. It was when you fell. <laughs> it was harder than it's harder than I thought whoa, at first because you fell on the ice. Yeah, it's a very different technique. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a very different technique. <laughs> you know, like you know, we bend our knees to skate and they push on that straight leg that's sliding oh, yeah. along you the ice. You so yeah. yeah. That's yeah. when you throw the stone, but not when How you're kind of you sliding up the so side, so sweeping. Oh, you yeah, your I, skates so I think you're doing your own here. <laughs> I know, they should actually wear skates here. That would make more sense. Be so they don't, oh, they don't even wear skates? No, no, no they and wear you shoes. still fell. Yeah, it's equivalent. It's a slippy shoe. It's harder just to walk on the ice than it is to skate. Could you just imagine? <laughs> with his little curl on one hand, his penguin in the other. <laughs> so that's a quote, isn't it? Honestly. World famous coach, it's a slippy shoe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm glad my I'm glad my joiner this is gonna name drop for our brother Ian McGurk's finished in my house because he's a mad curler. So he's, yeah. he's gonna hate everything I've just said. <laughs> no, I agree I agree with you. I'm I'm not an aficionado of winter sports, but you know ice skaters you have got all bases covered. 
you know, your athleticism, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, stamina, skill, artistry. It's all in there, really, yeah. compared to other sports. So I sort of agree with you. See, with the Olympics, obviously, the pinnacle, after that, will you still feel that you should be competing in things like the British and that and defending your titles? Or Yeah, I feel like the British is such a big event for me every year. Like, you always want to be the best in the country. So without going to the British and Europeans and worlds and things like that, you wouldn't be at the Olympics. For me, the British is, it's always been quite a big competition for me every year. Can I, can I tell you what she said, though, when we had this discussion? Because it's COVID tough. hit. COVID hit. And when she was thinking, do I continue? Because another cycle is a big commitment. So another four years or not, it's a big commitment. So when she was thinking, well, maybe I won't carry on for another four. And we got over that hurdle. But when she was thinking that stage, she realized that if she wins the next one she, and goes to Olympics, she's only won five. Yeah. And she actually said to me, I can't so do, an, I've got to do an even number. I've got to do an even number, so yeah. I'll at least go for six. Because I would, <laughs> well, potentially I would have got six if I had five sure. last year, and then six this year, I would have had six. And I was like, I want six. <laughs> so, <laughs> What's the record in the British? It's 11. It's Such Jenna. 11. It must be oh, Jenna. Is it, is it Jenna. I think like it is mentioned, Jenna, yeah. I, yeah, I wouldn't be able to do that, but... But you'll be like, you must be up high in the list of multiples. Um, yeah, yeah, must be yeah, close to the top, like, yeah. yeah. So does that make you, in British terms, an all-time great in figure skating? Um, <laughs> Just say it. Don't be shy. No, well, I mean, Jenna, obviously she was, but yeah. I guess... You're the next one? Yeah. It's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> I think what's I think what's fair to say, and I think we have to say this, is that, and, and anyone in figure skating will agree with us that she is the best example of someone who stuck in there and achieved what she wanted to achieve because when she didn't nail the harder jumps so many would have quit so that is like an attribute that not many have so people say to me other coaches say to me well what an inspiration she is to our athletes because she stuck in there and she eventually won that British title and she went from strength to strength. And and that, I mean, Jenna, you know, all credit to Jenna, she's won 11 titles, but, you know, again, she was super talented and she made, she went through and she went straight to the top and, and what's hard is getting to the top and then retaining your title, sure. which she did really well. But she didn't hit those harder jumps at 19. I mean, Jenna was, I don't know, 13, like, you know, she was like super talented kid. Tash didn't hit those jumps until 19. And I think that for anyone in figure skating is a massive achievement. So, you know, when you talk about people within the sport, I think she's one of the most inspirational for other young kids who struggle at that at that stage to be, to keep going. And, and that's essentially what all this is about, speaking to inspirational women. You are certainly one of those. There is not probably a better place to end it than this. We wish you so much luck in the Olympics. Thank We'd love you. to come back and talk to you about the experience afterwards, maybe, and see how that Thank went you. for you. Sure. I hope you get the funding, the press, and the coverage that you deserve. But for now, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you, guys. You. You've been listening to the Smokies and Wine podcast, sponsored by Clack and View Wealth Management, working with you today to plan for your tomorrow. 